the Adventists as a whole tend to be of a type of person that's willing to be different. It's um, not as strong nowadays as it used to be, but you have to be really like willing to stand out and be stand apart to be an Adventist. But um, you know, we've been working real hard as, as an Adventist organization to sort of <clears throat> get that to go away. And so we, we're not as different anymore as we used to be. But, um, but then to be an Adventist and now a believer in the one true God and His only Son, Jesus Christ, and their Holy Spirit, that's a whole new level of standing apart. <laughs> But I see that even in this group, you're not, you're not there yet to wear a red shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just wondering, <laughs> what's with you guys? <laughs> there they are, all piled up in yeah. sizes. Okay. Um, I'm so glad that my lovely wife could come and join us. I couldn't yeah. persuade her to put a red shirt on. <laughs> she said it's not her color. <laughs> but there we go. Um, those of you who, who haven't found out yet, uh, Jean asked me, what, <clears throat> one of the first things she asked me when we met on the telephone, is where I came from, and I said I come from my mommy's tummy, and that didn't somehow satisfy her. But um, Marta and I are from South Africa. There are some outstanding people from South Africa that you might know, like Smuts van Rooyen, sure, and <laughs> and Ian Hartley, sure, <laughs> and. How many more can I name? Uh, we, we're not one of them. We're, we're the other kind of South African. But um, we have done ministry of various kinds. Uh, I entered the seminary very briefly and very quickly realized that I did not want to be studying Bultmann and Bart and all the theologians and I, when I saw the book list I said eh, not so much. Um, in the first place I'm not a bookie person. I've, I, I struggled my way through school just by sheer determination uh, because I have a Teflon memory. Um, some, some of you like my wife have a Velcro memory and you remember stuff forever but um, so school was difficult, wasn't impossible, you know, with, with perseverance. Um, but I knew I didn't want to struggle to learn that stuff. So I, I left the seminary and uh, we had a, a good business going. Um, one, night, one night I just, just came upon me, just like, I can't explain it, but I actually sat up in bed and Wake and Martin said, I know what we're going to do. We're going to go to the School of Health at Loma Linda, and we're going to do the MPH, and we're going to do medical missionary work. And so, by God's grace and by the opening of his providences, we went, and we did it. And I, I got the degree, and she did the work. <laughs> she, she attended classes with me, and. Uh, it was good. <laughs> it worked out well. <clears throat> and then we went to West Virginia and we worked for a group of doctors who had been missionaries in Guam and they had decided together that they wanted to find a quote-unquote dark county uh, where they could set up their practice and begin, begin an Adventist work there. Um, so they found Summersville, West Virginia, and we were there for about three years. 
wasn't it? Three, three, three and a half years, something like that. In the process of time, uh, because uh, I was hired as a health educator, uh, we just Martin and I decided that one of the best ways to get in touch with people who had health interests was to have a health food store. <coughs> and so, by hook or by crook, we got a building in town on the main drag, an old house, and we converted it and we made a dining room and it had a kitchen and and we began, made shelves out of rough sawn boards and so on, and got it all stocked up on credit. And um, there were miracles that we could recount to, with regards to that, just finances were made available. We didn't know that we had them available to us. But anyway, that's not the point. The point is that God led us to do that. And then because we were doing that and it wasn't directly um, perceived to be forwarding the interests of the clinic, um, they made, made us, uh, gave us a, a choice, <laughs> shall we say. And uh, since we had invested so much in the health food store, we stayed with that and, and part of the company. But in the meantime, um, more and more we were realizing that um, teaching people how to live healthfully uh, it was good, but we didn't want to necessarily end up with a bunch of unsaved <coughs> vegans. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I was feeling more and more drawn to, to ministry. And mind you, I'd skipped out of seminary. The only um, leg up that I had was that my father had been an Adventist pastor and my uncles, three of them, had been Adventist pastors. And my grandfather, um, who immigrated from Ireland to South Africa, he became an Adventist and he became an Adventist minister. So three generations, you know, that should speak for something. It's in the genes, right? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> and so I was hired by the Michigan Conference to be a pastor. And Martyr, you couldn't find a better, more faithful and vigorous pastor's wife than she was. At the same time as she was homeschooling our boys and um, doing cooking schools and health education along with our pastoral ministry. Um, that's the way it went and then finally we we took a call to California after 10 years in, in Michigan and uh, the church was connected with a health center run by one Dr. Charles Thomas. Have you ever heard of that name? Well he was he was quite famous um, in Adventist circles because although he taught at the University and School of Health, his specialty was, as a physical therapist, his specialty was teaching hydrotherapy. And um, we actually, when I went through the School of Health, we both attended his hydrotherapy um, session for a whole quarter and learned quite a bit and got equipped and so forth to do hydrotherapy treatments. <clears throat> and so he had started this clinic, this um, health center in connection with the church and that's basically why I was called to that particular position. And we passed it there for, for some time and um, it was in interesting, many, many side issues that we could follow there. Um, And then we were called to a church in Chula Vista. And by that time, uh, in our studies of the gospel, we had learned some things that we really wish that we had learned way earlier uh, in our ministry, uh, way earlier in our raising of our boys. 
um, insights into the goodness of God and how much of the burden of our salvation he's taken upon himself. Amen. Namely, everything. Amen. And, um, you know, coming from the direction we come, you know, with the health and everything, one, one can get into that mode of uh, what's the next thing that I should add to my, you know, my credentials for heaven. And um, unfortunately, that sort of tinctured our gospel. Um, the gospel that our sons got from us. And our youngest son finally decided that at the age of 11 or 12, he's not going to make it, he won't make it to heaven. And he's losing out on fun. And he, long story short, he became a drug addict and a drug dealer and long hair, metal in all parts of his body, and sunken eyes staring out of this long hair in front of his face. And that is our precious son that was such a spiritual little boy um, as a child. Um, the other one was a quote unquote good boy. He was a bodybuilder and he still is a bodybuilder and he's 50 some years old. He lives just down the road here. He's a fishing guide right now in the Kootenai River. And um, so we were, we were learning about the gospel. And it was precious. It was, it was so wonderful to learn um, that we could cast all the cares upon him. And that God, in his love and in his mercy, uh, was simply saying, come. Come. I've, I've taken care of it. Just come. Yes. <laughs> and let me do my work in you. And, um, you know, the gospel, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Because the human, the human genome is, is wired for, for self-preservation. I mean, in, in the natural world, you know, if you don't hustle, then you get hungry or, or something. Something doesn't work out. You see people on the streets nowadays who've kind of they found out that they don't have to hustle, they can do a different type of hustle and still survive and have the drugs that they want and booze and so on. Um, so the human genome is, is biologically, we're, we're, so if we're living in the flesh, we know that we've got to, we've got to do something to make it. And it's been hard for me to learn. Um, I think Marta caught on sooner, and she encouraged me and, and badgered me and carried on to try and get me to, to believe that God would really take care of us. Um, but the point came where we were really committed to um, To believing what God says in His Word, and that when you when you go there, one can't really do it halfway. One has to be wholehearted about it. Um, and so then I was a pastor in a southeastern California conference. If you know anything about what's been happening in the church, you know that the southeastern California conference it's got a bit of a reputation. Um, but I was fine there as long as they left me alone because I just merrily did pastoral ministry and taught the gospel and that was good. But then I was put with another man in the, in the church on the Chula Vista and Marjorie was teaching gospel to young people like Miriam here and they were just lapping it up. They loved it. And they called their friends and their friends were coming to Sabbath school and then the pastor made them terrible mistake of having me preach every second Sabbath. <laughs> and so there was this contrast between one Sabbath and the next Sabbath. And um, there seemed to be more people coming on the one Sabbath than on the other Sabbath. And that wasn't good. And I had a bit of a bad attitude it was also, I think, you know, when you, when you think you've found the truth, sometimes it's 
the devil finds a way of even bringing in a little bit of human arrogance, um, even in that situation. We can be arrogant because we know that the Father and the Son and their spirit, their truth. Um, the Lord needs to preserve us. He needs to give us His spirit. He needs to give us the spirit of Jesus. Amen. So that we're not arrogant about the wonderful knowledge that He's given to us in His Word. Uh, how perverse is it to take something so wonderful as the Gospel and become arrogant about having it? Yeah. Now that's like, that's terrible. Um, anyway, so we ended up moving away from there and I um, I went to preach in a, in a church that had been without a pastor for six months or so. How many of you know of Needles, California? A nice, beautiful, cool, yeah. green oasis. <laughs> oasis. <laughs> ocean breeze. <laughs> in the summertime, you can you can literally fry an egg on the hood of your car. It is ungodly hot and dry and barren. But there were people there that they had a nice little church and so forth. And so I I went there as a guest speaker and um, spoke to them about the gospel. And after that I was gladly taking off my jacket and get to get in my car and get the air conditioner cranked up. And the first elder came running out and said, Pastor, Pastor, won't you please come and be our pastor here? I said, are you kidding? <laughs> Why would I move to Needles, California? He says, yes, but we, you know, we need the gospel so much. Uh, one thing and another, the conference made me all kinds of promises. <laughs> Just go, it'll be temporary. The first thing, something comes up around where you live, um, we'll let you interview for that, and you know, so it'll just be temporary. Well, four years later, I was still there. By that time, the church was split between those who loved the gospel and those that thought that I was a devil for teaching them the things that I taught them. I don't know, Bob might think it might be one of those. I, I have no idea. I'm not sure within my view of the gospel. We'll have to get to that, Bob. I might have to straighten you out. <laughs> um, in the meantime, Southeastern was at the spear's tip of the women's ordination fracas. And, you know, I looked at that pretty pretty closely and looked at the, the reasoning and most of all at the hermeneutic used by those who were promoting the putting of women in as the head of the church, as the lead pastor, and as a president of the conference, as it turns out later on in Southeastern. Um, and the hermeneutic in favor of that was the opening wedge for allowing homosexuality and all kinds of things. It's a um, it's the same kind of hermeneutic that says that the father and son relationship is a metaphor. It's that it's that kind of hermeneutic. And I said, no, we can't go. We can't go with that. Um, Martha and I were invited to be part of a, I think the first group, maybe it was the second group. Anyway, of a um, select people that they took up into the into the lodge up in the mountains um, to teach about how to be close to God, and it turned out to be um, there was a fellow by the name of Willard, Doctor Willard. Um, my mind is going, drawing a blank now on that, on that spiritual, spiritual um, formation. Spiritual formation. Ooh, Dallas. So they were teaching us, Dallas, Dallas, uh, teaching us spiritual formation. And you know, <clears throat> we're we're kind of earnest people. We we're 
Some people call it, put us in that category of earnest strivers. <laughs> people who want to be good. People who want to have a, a spiritual relationship with God. And so we thought, well, this is good. We need, we need to learn. Uh, but the more we listened and the more we... This is... Uh, there's, there's something. There's something amiss. And so we withdrew from that. Just, no. Um, so that's kind of our experience. Um, I think that probably didn't sit very well with conference leadership. It probably didn't sit well with conference leadership that um, I was known to be not non-compliant with the women's ordination idea. Um, I was also known to be a problem in conservative churches. Because they, cons they looked at me as a conservative pastor. So you need to go to Chula Vista, it's a conservative church. You need to go to Needles at the conservative church. And every time I went, <laughs> caused a problem because some people just didn't, do not like the pure gospel. And the pure gospel is, God is telling us He's taken care of the problem. And he is saying, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you a whole list of good things that you need to strive to attain. Yeah. No. And um, so when I was at Needles, the same thing happened. The church was split about almost, almost exactly in half, like about 49, 48, 48, 50. And um, the 50 percent wrote letters, made phone calls. Um, they went to the conference. When we were just sitting at the table, somebody suggested, well, the solution is to go to the conference, and that's when I let out a guffaw, because <laughs> because um, that's what that's what they did. They went to the conference, and the um, conference didn't do anything immediately. But eventually, I got a, a slip in the mail that said your services are no longer required, um, which is kind of cold. Um, they didn't call me in, counsel me, try and help me out, whatever, just like, we don't need you anymore, gone. So that ended 22 years of pastoral ministry. And um, my wife said, you need to do ministry regardless. And I said, I need to find a way of making money because we're, we're running out of options. And um, for years and years, I strove to make some money, but the Lord provided for us anyway, even though I was unsuccessful in making money. Um, and we were just telling Jean how that God has helped us to downsize. Uh, till now, we're living in a little two-room, two-bedroom apartment, a HUD apartment causing an urban development of federal government. And we are so blessed to be totally under his care. And all the wealth that we had at one time the properties that we owned, I um, haven't told you about that, but it's all gone. And we are more content and just as fat and sassy as we ever were. <laughs> you know, we, we're clothed, we buy lots of our clothes from a used place down here and we find good garments and we, and we are well clothed. And once in a while we go to Ross and get something. 
and um, we've got a little old car, 93 Toyota, and um, we get around with it, God's providing that. So why do I tell you all of this? Just to give you a picture of a journey that us two little waifs in the world have journeyed, learning to trust in God. We're still learning. There's so much more that we need to learn. We, like I say, we, we're slow to learn and quick to forget. And sometimes we worry about things that we shouldn't worry about, but I think that we're worrying less now than we ever worried before. And we had so much more before to worry about. <laughs> so, um, so again, the point is, the point of telling you this is just to give you a picture of learning to trust and rest in the provision of our God. And um, so what I'd like to talk about, and my time's almost gone already. <laughs> So having set us up about the gospel, now I'm going to read something from Stephen Haskell about the judgment. Seems kind of paradoxical, but it's not. The judgment is actually the good news. Yes, it is. It is the good news about what God has done to save us. Amen. So I'd like to read this. Um, from Stephen Haskell, I didn't put down what the, but it's from his book, the um, about the sanctuary. You know that book. Yeah. It's online. Cross the shadow. Yes. Cross the shadow. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. The judgment is spoken of by every Bible writer. It is mentioned over a thousand times in the sacred writings, and I haven't prayed yet. So, Father in heaven, we've spoken, we've shared. Um, As we look at these things, we just ask, our oh, Father, be merciful to us and teach us by your Spirit. Lord Jesus, come next to us like you did with the disciples Amen. and be our teacher. Amen. That these words, men's words, written down, might be imbued with life-changing and encouraging message from your throne. We ask in Jesus' name. So the judgment is spoken of by every Bible writer. It's mentioned over a thousand times. Did you know that the Bible is so full of judgment? It is more solemn than death, for death separates friends only until the resurrection. But the judgment separates them forever. No one can escape it. To ignore the thought of the judgment and live without preparing for it will not evade it. Solomon recognized this fact when he wrote, Rejoice, O young man or young woman, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. <laughs> Have a good time, he says. And walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But no. Thou, that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. So be happy, but just remember there's, there's an accounting to give for your life. The decisions of earthly courts may often be changed by money and friends, and the guilty may be released, but not so in the heavenly court. There, everyone must meet the record of his own life. Everyone shall give account of himself to God, we're told. Earthly parents have been known to sacrifice everything they possessed to save one child from the condemnation of earthly courts. Can we imagine that our Heavenly Father would let Satan destroy all his earthly children without an effort to save them? And that's the point. That's the point right there. He risked all heaven for their sakes. 
God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Thank you for that study this morning. That puts that, that just allows that text to speak to our hearts the way it should. When we realize that God actually does have an only begotten son. Mm -hmm. The son that came out from him. As the writer of the proverb says, they were as those who grew up together. Meaning they were so close. They were like tight. God so loved the world. When you consider the love between the father and the son, how wonderful and how long that has been, we can't even imagine. It's eternity. But yet he loved the world. I don't understand that. But Jesus said, the Son of God says, God, his Father, loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How simple. Whosoever believeth in the Son of God hath eternal life. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's not load it up with other stuff. <laughs> let's just believe it as it comes. As Paul said to the to the jailer, we asked, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. If they believe, they also be saved. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. No human being can face his life record in the books of heaven and escape condemnation unless faith in Christ and a love for his service is a part of that record. Christ, the heavenly advocate or comforter, if you will, will plead the cases of all who have given him their sins. He says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. The life record, scarlet with sins and wretchedness, the Savior covers with a spotless robe of righteousness. And the judge, looking upon it, sees only the sacrifice of his Son. And the record is accepted in the Beloved. Amen. Who can reject such infinite love. Amen. That's good news. Amen. Amen. That's the good news. Amen. Yes. And there was pages of notes that I got here speaking about the atonement. But it might just muddy it up if I go on and try and explain that. I'll see what I can do for, what's it, Sunday? Amen. Oh, yeah. yes. I think I think I have one more chance. I'll, I'll have one more whack at it. <laughs> but um, you know, the, the Day of Atonement, briefly, I, I, I want to talk about the Day of Atonement because we're living in the Day of Atonement. Um, I don't need to explain that to you. I know that you're well acquainted with that. 2300 days in 1844 and so forth. We're living in the Day of Atonement, which was represented <laughs> typically Is that an amen or <laughs> time to stop? <laughs> Where were we before, sir? Did you drop? Um, the Day of Atonement. And so the Day of Atonement is actually a wonderful picture of God wrapping up the whole 
salvation history. Amen. Salvation history that started before the world began. And sometimes people say, well, that means that God was, he knew that he, people were going to sin, and so therefore he just, he started doing it ahead of time. I'm, I suppose there's, a, there's an aspect of that to it, because God does know everything from the end from the beginning. But I think what that really tells us is that God is a kind of person that if something like that went wrong, he would take care of it. I think, I think that's the meaning of before the foundation of the world. That's the, the kind of beings, the kind of character that the Father and the Son have. Is that if anybody went astray, if anybody messed up, that they would be there to catch them. Amen. Just the picture is given in the Bible of the eagle when they kick the little eagle eaglet out of the nest <laughs> and is flapping and flopping and going down. The mother eagle will swoop underneath and pick them up and take them up high and then drop them again <laughs> so that they learn to fly. Um, God in the, in, the, in the Day of Atonement is teaching us that when he is through with us, if we will submit to him, if we will believe in his son Jesus Christ, this is what he wants to do for us. And what he wants to do for us is to bring us to the point where we trust him so wholeheartedly and that he can dwell within us as his promise in John 14, 23. That the Father and the Son can dwell within us by their spirit with such complete freedom in our house that they can cause us to walk as Jesus walked. Mm -hmm. I really believe that that's what God wants to do to us or with us. He won't do it without our consent. But this generation, and I'm thinking I'm going to miss out on it because we're old and not so well. <laughs> so maybe these two here and that one there will be the ones that God will do this for. Because we're told in inspiration that the time will come in his work for us, in his, in his wonderful formation of our character, that the great and precious promises of God will be so fulfilled in us that his character will be so permanent in us that he will say, let him that is holy be holy still. Let him that is righteous be righteous still. And then there will no longer be a mediator. Why? Because there will be no need of a mediator. Because he will have such complete possession of the souls of men and women of that last generation that they will not turn to the right or to the left in thought or in deed. He will possess them just as the Spirit of God dwelt within the Son who was in our flesh, our fallen, sin-prone flesh. He took it and he caused it to live a righteous life and he gives us that life. When we give up our life, he gives us his life. Not only as a record in heaven that God looks at and says, okay, instead of looking at Jasper, I'm looking at the righteous life of Jesus. What a relief, Jasper. Yeah. And when he looks at and when he looks at the record of Patrick, he says, Man, I'm so glad that's hidden behind. It's covered with the righteousness. And um, And so now we are the sons of God. Right? Amen. But it doth not appear what we shall be. 
but we know that we will be like him when he comes and we shall see him as he is. Amen. That is the work that he wants to do in us. It is not a steep glass mountain to climb. It is the warm invitation from our Heavenly Father who is the creator of heaven and earth and he can do it. If he says he can do it, he will do it. The gospel, as we said on Sabbath, is the power of God unto salvation. And what is the power of God? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the God spoke, and it was. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Let there be creeping things, and there were creeping things. And so when he speaks righteousness into our souls, and we believe him, just like the paralytic lying there at the at the water's edge. Jesus said, get up, take up your bed and walk. He could either believe it and get up and walk, or he could just stay there. That's the same option that we have. God says, I want to make renew and right spirit within you. I want to make you over again. I want to give you a complete new birth. I want to give you a different life. And he can do it. Father in heaven, it is so precious to know that you are a father. Amen. Not a committee. You are a father. You love the world so much. It means that you loved Kevin and Jerry and each one of us so much that you allowed your only begotten Son to come and be us so that when he died, we died. The ju when judgment was meted out upon him, that is the judgment that we deserved and that our names are now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We yield ourselves to you into your hands. We commit our spirit that you might do with us as you will. Is our prayer in Jesus' name.